Hello everybody, this is Philip Jonas at Kalamazoo Valley Community College presenting OpenStax Principles of Economics and today we're covering sections 22.1 and 22.2 Introduction to Inflation. In this module you will learn how to describe how the consumer price index is measured, how to use a reference period to calculate an index number, how to calculate an inflation rate, how to identify ways in which the Bureau of Labor Statistics reduces bias in the CPI, and how to differentiate between the CPI, PPI, IPP, ECI, and GDP, IPD. Don't worry, we'll get to it. So today we are going to learn about our final headline macroeconomic data series, having to date covered gross domestic product, GDP, and of course, the unemployment rate. Our final measure is, of course, the headline inflation rate. And there is more than one way to measure, but let's start with the most official one. Here is our recent press release from the Bureau of Labor Statistics presenting new consumer price index figures. So, as you can maybe read from our press release here, we see that Prices are up 0.3% in January over previous month December and 3.1% year over year. And also down here on page 1 we've got a nice little chart of the monthly changes in our consumer price index. Let's talk about where these numbers come from and in a future module how they are used. So the consumer price index, that's often what you'll hear about as shorthand for the inflation rate in the United States. But it turns out there is more than one of them. By default, the consumer price index we talk about is the so-called CPIU. U stands for urban here, which at first might make you think that we're only covering prices that are relevant for people living in big cities, but urban has a very broad definition here. We're covering people, yes, in cities, but also in so-called metropolitan areas. And if you take all that population into account, this is covering the price experience of over 90% of the US population. So we've only got, you know, rural areas, maybe farming families, those sorts of consumers that aren't being directly surveyed here. Now, the idea of the consumer price index, as opposed to something like GDP, where we're looking at total production in the United States, with the consumer price index, we are really trying to capture the experience of an individual consumer. So the dream here is basically to construct a cost of living index or COLE that tracks one for one how consumers cost of living changes. Um, obviously there are some practical limits to that, right? We can't exactly capture, for example, you know, how much sunshine our um, people are experiencing. But when it comes to prices sold in stores and online, well, that's something we can track. So based on this, you hear about the headline inflation number, such as, for example, right now, 3.1% if we're talking year over year. Now, the CPIU is probably the CPI that's being talked about when nothing else is specified, but there are some related numbers. Like, for example, its much older cousin, the CPIW, started all the way in 1913, and it started out by... Um, tracking the price experiences of just wage and clerical workers. So that was closer to like 30% of the population. But because inflation measures are so important to drive policy decisions, the CPIW, for example, then was used to adjust social security payments every year so that senior citizens in retirement could keep up with inflation. And to this day, we are still using that CPIW number for that specific subcase of Social Security. You can think of this as like a subset of the CPIU. And then there are some much more exciting newer developments we will get to at the end of this module. But let's start out by learning about the basics of how the consumer price index works. So this is a huge project. As I mentioned, it's being collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And they conduct a survey 
of 75 areas in the United States, so these are these urban and metropolitan areas, covering 60,000 household units and 22,000 retailers for those prices. And the first thing that's established is, so what is a representative consumer in the United States even buying? Now, obviously, we are not going to try to track all the millions of distinct products that actual households might be buying, but based on the overall list, the BLS then condenses that down into 94,000 prices that are considered representative. And, of course, since housing is such a major component of the cost of living, also 8,000 rent quotes that are used both to figure out what it costs to rent a place, but also if you own a place to work out the owner-occupied rent equivalent that we discussed back in our module on GDP. So this list of categories represented by these prices, this nowadays is updated every January. So it's not, you know, exactly real time, but there is an update on an annual basis that looks one or two years back in terms of what the survey data shows. And then, here comes the even more impressive part, these products in their respective categories are then directly tracked by the BLS every single month. And yes, some of those prices they look up online or maybe they call a business, but two-thirds of that data collection is actual walking into bricks and mortar stores and looking at some prices. So what this CPIU then is, is it, it looks at this bundle of goods and services established it in January and asks how is the collective price of all these products changing month after month. And in order to make it a little bit more relatable, the actual number is converted into an index number. So this is a little bit like the idea of the GDP deflator, that's an index number as well, where for the current CPIU that reference year is 1982 through 84, depending on the specific products we're talking about. So nowadays the CPIU is up in the hundreds since we're so far away from the reference period. But of course, reference periods can change as well. So I think the first thing we should then have a look at is, so what's actually in this, this bundle that's being tracked by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And as I already mentioned, if we look at the expenditure of the typical American consumer, and this is as of December 2023, you can see that the largest category here is housing expenditures. And that's both, you know, the cost of the shelter itself, your rent, your owner equivalent rent, but also, for example, your utility cost for gas or electric. And then if we Add to that housing cost the next two major categories. Here we've got transport, so that's both the cost of vehicles itself, but also, for example, the gas, and our food and beverages. Sort of a neat rule of thumb emerges. 75% of consumer expenditures are accounted for by those three categories. Housing, transport, food. Which if you think ahead a little bit, what that means, of course, is when we look at the official rate of inflation in the United States, 75% of it, if you will, is explained by the extent to which prices changed in those three categories. Those are the majors. You get big movements and one of those, it, it's going to dominate your inflation rate. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, uh, but some people are, for example, under the impression that when we work out inflation rates, that uh, the cost of gas isn't in there, <laughs> either you gas in the car or like natural gas to the house or something like that. No, no, no. Those are major categories, very important to track. They're definitely in there, but we'll talk about why sometimes you want to look at those separately. And everything else we uh, pay for as consumers, you know, has to fit into these remaining slices. Now, 
something you might notice here, right? Like, for example, if we look at that medical care slice, you might say to yourself, hey, um, I know that the US spends more than 8% of its national income on medical care. So like, why is this slice so small? Keep in mind, with the consumer price index, we are looking at spending only from the consumer's perspective. So if, for example, you work for a business that pays for part of your health insurance, what the business has to pay does not show up in this number. We would have to use a different price index for that. Or if, for example, you are um, insured by Medicare, by the government, you're, you're a little bit on the older end of the spectrum, again, that, that's not going to show up as a consumer expenditure anymore. However, with all these fun categories out of the way, we do now have to dive into the math in order to really understand how a consumer price index works. So here is a set of numbers that are of course completely made up um, of 12 months worth of hypothetical consumer expenditure data on apples, bananas, and citrus fruit. Now, these are, by the way, real detail categories in the consumer price index. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics does track down to this level. And just to keep it a little bit more realistic, it is also true that expenditures over here on the citrus side tend to be about twice as relatively important as apples and bananas individually for American households or as important as apples and bananas put together. So hopefully you enjoy that little bit, little bit extra there. Okay, so we start out by surveying our consumers and the retailers on what is actually being purchased and we set that list in January. So for the sake of argument, here's our new list of products. Consumers this year are assumed to be buying four apples, six bananas and 12 citrus fruit every month. And then we establish an average price within each of those categories. So while, for example, the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics goes down to the level of saying, hey, uh, we're going to have a detailed category here for the price of bananas. It samples multiple banana prices within that category and then averages them together in, in a way that basically makes, if one brand of bananas gets crazy expensive, makes it not hit the overall number so much. Or if there's like a sale on one type of banana, it doesn't make um, price just crater. It uses something called a geometric average. Don't worry about it if you don't quite know what that means. And what we can do based on this information now is every month we can, if you will, ask the question, so how much are our consumers spending in total? And of course, in the actual detailed categories, we would have hundreds of categories now, but let's just stick to the apples, bananas, and the citrus. Um, before we start putting our first monthly expenditures together, let's also just get a little bit familiar with the data. So basically, I'm showing you three sets of price behaviors that can happen here. First, looking at the apples. The apples behave sort of really nice and predictably. Small increases every once in a while, and number only goes up. And then we've got the bananas. At first, a little bit like the apples, small increases, just going up, but then, holy Michael, there in October, all of a sudden, bananas cost like, what, $10? And finally, we've got our citrus fruit here. They go up a little bit, and then the price craters, and it jumps, and it craters, and it jumps, and then it stabilizes again. So we want to talk a little bit about what each of those sort of behaviors is going to do to our consumer price index. But step number one, step number one, we just have to figure out how much are our consumers actually spending here, right? So we're computing a monthly expenditure. This is exactly what you would expect it to be. We are adding up what does it cost to buy this entire set of products. So in other words, we're taking the number of apples being purchased, QA, by the price of the apples, number of bananas purchased, QB, price of bananas, and quantity of the citrus times price of the citrus. One more time, part of the method of the consumer price index is that the quantities are going to stay the same. It's only the prices that vary. 
So let's go ahead and start in January. We've got four apples at 75 cents each. So that's $3. We've got six bananas at 50 cents each. That's another $3. And we've got our citrus 12 at $1 each. That's $12. So we add all of that together. Our consumer expenditure in January is $18. Wanna do it again? Of course you do. So let's go ahead and advance to February. Still four apples, still 75 cents, still $3, but the banana is now at 53 cents, so that's $3.18, and also our citrus are bumped up a little bit to $1.03. So that, of course, means that the total expenditure is going up. In fact, for our first increase here, we could even look at the, the subcategories a little bit. Our apples are experiencing zero inflation. Our bananas are increasing 6%. And our citrus are increasing 3%. Now, in a minute, we want to combine these individual price percentage increases into an overall inflation rate. So that's where this is going. But first, let's do March one more time with a very sort of standard month here. Apple's still at 75 cents, other two products bump up, overall expenditure goes up a little bit. But now let's get also a little bit into the crazier months. So if you have a look at May, right, that's one of the months where the price of citrus is cratering down to 18 cents. So here we've got a real citrus effect which of course means our monthly spending is actually falling, right? We're gonna have the opposite of inflation here, that's called deflation. And then another month we wanna be looking at, June, here, citrus fluctuation in the opposite direction. So of course we get a big bump in the expenditure. And then finally, in October, we have the banana event, where bananas not only start costing $10, I mean, much bigger swing there than with the citrus, but with the citrus is sort of bump, bouncing up and down, the bananas go up to 10 and they stay at 10. So we'll, we'll track what each of those behaviors does to our consumer price index. So what I've shown you here is how you convert the individual quantities and prices into an overall monthly expenditure. Let's go ahead and replace the entire table on the left with the monthly expenditure number because we are not going to need the subcategories anymore. And then we're going to talk about the two major figures you want to be able to calculate. The first one is an index number. So that's the thing that's called the consumer price index. The second thing is the rate of inflation which is not quite the same as a little hint in here. We've already got percentage symbols pre-filled. The rate of inflation is the change in an index number expressed as a percentage, right? So an index number, overall level, just a number, inflation rate, percentage change in a number, it's got a percentage sign at the end. So let's talk a little bit about setting this index number. What you do to set an index number is you choose yourself a reference period. You basically say, okay, here's a point in time, and I'm just gonna say that point in time, we're gonna call that 100. So you already see that pre-filled here. I'm gonna say, let's make January our reference period. So let's mark that. That means our basis for calculation is these things cost $18 as a bundle. We're gonna do everything index-wise, relative to when these things cost $18. And now we calculate how prices are changing relative to our reference period. So what that means is we are going to divide what's the actual current expenditure on products divided by the reference period expenditure, and then we're gonna multiply by the number 100. That's not 100%, that's just the number 100, unitless reference number. So you could, if you will, sort of, you could do that in the reference period. You could divide $18 by $18, multiply it by 100, and be amazed that an index number of 100 pops out. But let's go ahead and start in February instead, where we actually have something to do. So in February, our current expenditure is $18.54. We're spending a little bit more on our basket of fruit here. And we're going to divide that 
by our reference period, $18. So you can see we're gonna end up with a fraction here that's slightly above one, since, you know, number went up. But rather than having something slightly above one, we're gonna multiply the result by 100, just to make it sort of easier for us to look at. So we do the math here. This is an increase from 100 to 103. Or in other words, the division would give you 1.03 times 100 takes us to 103. This number is what's called, for this example, a consumer price index. It's just a unitless reference number. Let's do this one more time because there is one mistake that's unfortunately easy to make. So let's say we're doing the same exercise for March. In March, we're spending $19.14 on apples, bananas, and citrus. And we have to divide that, caution, by the reference period, right? So this is not a situation where you're going to the previous period. You're always going all the way back to the reference period. Everything is relative to the reference period. So now in March, $19.14 as opposed to reference period $18 times 100 to make it easier to work with. Now the number bumps up to a little over 106. This is the basic method of converting an expenditure, which for the real consumer price index would just be a completely unwieldy number, right? And make it into a nice and easy to understand sort of, you know, three digit thing centered around the number 100, something all of us like to work with. Now, I do want to point out some of the special months here. Remember May, where the price of those citruses tanked? So what happens if our expenditure falls below the reference period? The math still totally works. So this is the citrus event. Again, you're taking your current expenditure, which is now a lower number, you divide all the way back to the reference period, no matter how far back that is, multiply by 100. Now, of course, since the current expenditure is now a lower number than your reference period, that means you're going to end up with a fraction that's less than one and multiply by 100, you're gonna end up with an index number that is less than 100. Totally okay, that simply means the bundle of goods and services has a lower price tag than it did back in our reference period. In fact, if we were going backwards relative to our reference period, you'd sort of expect that to happen, right? Like if the current consumer price index reference period is 1982 through 1984, and you're looking at a number from way before that, 1950, like that would obviously be way lower than 100. Okay, so that was a month where the prices really fluctuated down. And then likewise, if we are looking to the banana event in October, where the prices went way up, all the way up to $81, notice there's sort of no upper limit on what this index number can be. It, it, can, it can get very big. It's, it's just a unitless reference number. So these numbers right here, this is what we would refer to as the consumer price index. But it's not the same as a rate of inflation. So people sometimes use that inter-exchangeably because we typically calculate the rate of inflation using the consumer price index. But the rate of inflation is a percentage change. So here now I filled in for you all the index numbers and we're going to work out some rates of inflation, which is just the percentage increase in the index number relative to whatever period you want to do it. So for our purposes here, we will do month over month inflation, like that nice little chart there we saw in our news release at the beginning of this module. Of course, another very common way of calculating inflation, um, as I read from the press releases, that you can also look at it year over year. We don't have numbers for that here on our table, but for example, if you wanted to work out the rate of inflation from January of this year compared to a year ago, you would have to use the index number from January from previous year, but we're gonna do month over month. So month over month, standard percentage change formula here, you're taking the difference between the number, current minus previous, and then you're dividing by the previous period. Now that by itself is technically already correct. However, let me add here that the percentage conversion could be accomplished by multiplying by 100%. Depends a little bit how you were taught how to do percentages. Mostly I'm putting that there to emphasize 
The index number is an index that simply gets multiplied by 100. The inflation rate is a percentage, so you're converting from a decimal to a percentage there, such as by multiplying by 100%. And since the inflation rate is a percentage change between two numbers, of course, we can't calculate that for our top row because we don't have the data from December of previous year. So we are going to start in February where we have a nice and even result. Look at that. Our index number went from 100 to 103. So that of course means we have an increase of plus three index points on a convenient base of 100. Three over 100, that is 0 0.03, which is the same number as 3%. I'm going to do everything using two decimal points here, even though this specific one would work out to be 3% on the dot. Okay, so far so good. But now, let's make sure in March, we keep going correctly. So in March, our previous period would be February, assuming we're doing month over month inflation, right? So for March, we're taking our current index, 106, and we're subtracting and then dividing by 103. Okay, so a little bit careful here. When calculating the index to begin with, we always go back to the reference period. When calculating an inflation rate, we are just going back to the previous period. So what that previous period is changes with every single month we're calculating. All right, so March, 106 minus 103, that's about 3.33 over 103, the inflation rate here, 3.24%. Because, you know, January, February, March, our prices were behaving relatively normally. Now, of course, let's look at a second way in which you could get these numbers. You might have already noticed. Instead of calculating the percentage increase in the index number, I could have gone all the way back to the total expenditures on apples, bananas, and citruses. If I take the increase in spending here, an additional 60 cents, and divide it by the first of those numbers, 1854, it's also 3.24%. So if all you're after is the inflation rate, you can sort of choose, do I look at the percentage increase in the index or the expenditure, because they're just scaled for one another, right? Nice little shortcut there if you ever want to have it. But Follow the long way if you want to, it'll, it'll never steer you wrong. Now, let's get to a crazy month. Citrus event, May. Citrus prices crashing. So our index number is actually falling. Now, the formula still totally works. You just have to make sure you use it correctly. You know, the formula isn't take the bigger number, subtract the smaller number. No, no, formula is take the current number, subtract the previous number. So our current number here is 49.78, we're subtracting the previous number, 112.44, dividing by the previous number, 112.44. And of course, what that means is, because up here in the numerator, we've got a smaller number, subtracting a bigger number, we are going to end up with a negative result. That's kind of crucial when you're working out an inflation rate. You know, you really want to know if it's a positive percentage or a negative percentage. Are you looking at inflation or deflation? So one more time. If the price index is falling, that means you're looking at deflation. You're looking at a negative percentage change. And then, of course, we had uh, sort of another crazy event here in October where the bananas go to $10. So let's just see how the percentages behave when our price increases are really, really big. So again, I'm going to go off the index numbers here. You could go off the price numbers. You'll get the same results. We've got a really big index number, 451, mm -hmm. subtracting our previous number, 136, dividing by 136. Do the conversion correctly, and you end up with, you know, at first 2.33 or so, and then convert into percentage, 233%. So, you know, if the decimal result you get is 2.33 or so, you still have to do the percentage conversion. This isn't a 2.33% increase, this is an over 200% increase. Or in yet other words, inflation rates absolutely can go over 100%. This isn't some sort of sum of total here, it's a period over period change. They shouldn't go over 100%, like you've done something bad in managing your economy if that happens, but they can, and we want to measure that as well. 
Now, let me show you one more thing that can sometimes produce a slight disconnect between the numbers and the public perception, okay? So we've got the index number and we've got the inflation rate. Most people in public only talk about the inflation rate because it's a percentage and like who even knows what the index number stands for unless you take an economics course. So look what happens with this banana event October to November. The bananas are staying at $10, right? Our consumer expenditures went from $35, $24, whatever you want to consider to be a reasonable baseline here, went up into the 80s and are staying at the 80s. Or in other words, compared to our index number at the beginning of the year, which we set at 100, now consumer expenditures are over four times higher, up in the 400s. However, when calculating the inflation rate from October to November, the big price increase has already happened, right? So now for November, we'd be taking 455 minus 451 over 451. And that's actually a relatively small aggregate increase, about 0.9%. So when you see that inflation rate come down from over 200% and hey, look, now it's 0.1%, some people might look at that and say, how can you say this percentage is so small? Bananas are still super expensive. Well, the inflation rate refers to the change in the prices of products, not their level. So just because the rate is coming down and we've sort of beaten high levels of inflation doesn't mean prices will return to their previous level. I mean, they could, but just lower percentage level doesn't, doesn't automatically imply that. In fact, if they were to decrease across the board, we'd need negative inflation rates for that to happen, which at the moment may sound kind of cool, as we will learn in a future module, not cool. Uh, economy is actually very bad at dealing with sustained deflation. So we, we like to get inflation rates down to a low, low, low level, but not into the negatives. We're not so happy with those. Okay, let's review this one more time and let me put in also all the missing numbers in case you want to, you know, freeze frame here, do a little exercise on your own, check your own work. In general, there are three math steps you have to be familiar with. Number one, based on the prices and quantities of the individual goods, put together the expenditure total, the price of the basket, whatever you want to call it, of all those, you know, apples, bananas, and citruses. For that, it's just price times quantity added up across the board for however many products you have. Relatively straightforward. Then the two you really have to pay attention to because they get sometimes a little jumbled up in people's heads. We've got the index number, such as the consumer price index, where we're taking total expenditures current divided by total expenditures in a reference period. And that reference period stays put. It's always the same reference period, no matter how far away we are, that's kind of the point. And we're multiplying the result by the unitless index number 100. So these indices, they do not represent changes. They are a level relative to the reference period. And then number three, we've got the rate of inflation. That's where we're looking at changes. This is what makes the news. We're looking for the percentage increase in the number here. And in real life, the percentage increase here is calculated off the index number because in real life, the dollar figures get crazy when you do a consumer price index. But you know, in a, in a nice little exercise like this, it turns out you can work out an inflation rate very easily, either by looking at the percentage increase in the index or the percentage increase in the expenditure total, same result either way. These are expressed as a percentage, which of course also means these can turn negative. Expenditure totals cannot turn negative and therefore index numbers can turn negative either. Negative prices, that would be cool, get money for buying a product, but that is not at all how the world works. So that was a fun little detour here through the math that really you need to have a little bit of a feel for so that you can understand how the real world consumer price index behaves. Like basically, what the consumer price index is designed to deal with are the first couple of months here I've got highlighted, January through April. We've got a couple of products, they're increasing in price. Not every product is increasing at the same speed. That's okay, we're gonna aggregate that together and then crank out an overall level of price increases. 
Now, where Consumer Price Index still, you know, technically produces a correct result, but gets tougher to follow, is we is if we have a product that suddenly starts fluctuating. So for Citrus, I did that in May through August here with some big up and down swings, which means in each of those months, you know, big minus or plus percentage changes, which by itself is actually kind of fine. Like we're accurately representing what the happening to the prices of these products. Uh, only if we're trying to figure out what the overall trend in our economy is, then if you have something that's really noisy bouncing up and down, it makes it harder to see the underlying trend. And then with a consumer price index, at least in its uh, traditional method, falls on its face a little bit, is if you've got a product like the bananas suddenly exploding in price. Now, why am I saying the consumer price index falls on its face here a little bit? Well, because the consumer price index is calculated on the notion that we have a set of products and then we're just going to say everybody keeps buying these categories in the same amounts all year long. And if the bananas go to $10, <laughs> are our consumers actually going to keep buying six bananas every month? I'm going to go ahead and say no. <laughs> They'll probably take their banana consumption to zero and then maybe buy some more apples or something like that. And that mm, normal consumer price index unfortunately doesn't capture that. So it gets thrown a little bit off course. But fear not. In addition to this entire statistical project of the consumer price index being very impressive in its own right, the Bureau of Labor Statistics also employs some clever techniques to deal with exactly these types of biases. Let's go back to the press release we started this module with. Now, you might be looking at this graph and you might be thinking to yourself, this is not the press release we started this module with. Correct, this is page two of that press release. <laughs> On page two, at the top of the page, zoomed in here a little bit, we see a graph that shows the inflation rate, but not month over month, that's what happens on page one, but instead year over year. So you see 12 month percent change. And as of this report, remember consumer price index here in blue, the year over year change was 3.1%. There's our 3.1% number. But you'll notice right on page two, we have a second graph in red. All items, less food and energy. So this is what's supposed to help us with the problem that the citrus fruit gave us in our math example. What if you have some prices that just tend to bounce around a lot, so they kind of make it hard to see the underlying trend? Well, prices that tend to bounce around a lot, for a lot of reasons, are prices for food and energy. So sometimes it's a little easier to look at the world of inflation without those prices in it. This you will also hear referred to as the core CPI for short. Taking the CPI, the core products here meaning removing food and energy products. Okay. I want to be really clear here. When it comes to the official rate of inflation, food and energy are totally in there. The blue line is the official line. The red line is just a second line that's supposed to help you figure out where everything else is going if food and energy are bouncing around a lot. It's just supposed to add a little perspective. Again, Some people walk away with the impression that like, oh, the inflation rate doesn't include like, you know, gas or Snickers bars. No, no, absolutely in there. I mean, people buy that, very important. Let me basically show you a um, little bit further down here on page two what happens. So top of page two, we've got our nice little chart here. And now we go a little bit more down and we see how food and energy are defined. So here in food and energy, and this isn't even the detailed categories yet. This is, this is bigger 
major categories. But what we're basically taking out with the so-called core CPI measure, we're taking out food in the sense of food at home, food away from home, actually gets tracked separately. And we're taking out energy in terms of we've got the gas, but we also have fuel oil. And then also, for example, your electric, your, your, your um, natural gas prices. And if you have a lock, right? If you have a lock, you will notice that in this time period covered by this press release, for example, we had huge decreases in fuel oil cost. And look, look at that utility here, right? Natural gas down 18%. So that can throw us off. If we look, I'm going to go back up to the top of the page. If we look at our headline inflation measure, we're like, oh, 3.1%. We're getting more in line with where we want to be, right? But then you look at the detail and you're like, wait, there was an 18% decrease in the price of natural gas. That's just a crazy swing. That's not going to continue falling like that, right? So like underlying price pressures may be a little higher than what the headline measure might suggest. Now, notice also, I'll follow up on this in just a second, that this breakdown is a little different from the major expenditure categories of which I showed you a pie chart earlier. So from the pie chart, hopefully you remember housing, transport, food and beverage, right? Look at transport, for example. So transport does include gasoline, which is excluded if you're only looking at core CPI, but transport also includes, for example, prices of new vehicles, which is still in the core CPI. So these categories we're taking out, food and energy, they're sort of separate categories from the major expenditure categories. I'll reconcile those for you in just a second. Let's go ahead, look at the rest of this table, bottom of page two of the press release to tell you what I'm talking about. So if we look at our core items, so that's everything less food and energy, in here we have you know, all the commodities, the cars, the trucks, the clothes. We also have in here the shelter. So again, with the housing cost, right? Natural gas, that's energy. We're gonna take that out of core CPI. Base shelter cost, that's staying in. That is definitely a core CPI number. So let me go back to the pie chart to relate that. These are the eight major expenditure categories in the consumer price index. We looked at it just a minute ago, right? And then when we do core CPI or CPI excluding food and energy, we are basically removing some of the expenditures in housing, transport, and food and beverages. Well, most in food and beverages. The beverages stay, all the food goes away. Um, but the Transport, we're just taking basically the energy prices out of transport. And with housing, again, we're just taking the energy prices out of housing. Other categories here, they stay in all the way. Okay, so let me show you one more time why we do that. I already did it using the table, but now let's actually look at some data here for the 21st century so you can start to get a feel for this. And you'll very quickly see why core CPI is a good buddy-buddy measure for your overall CPI. So what you're looking at here for the 21st century is the rate of inflation in the United States. And we've got, you know, reference bar here at zero. So that's the difference between inflation and deflation. And as always, we've got our three recessions so far to um, orient ourselves. We've got the 2001 recession here. We've got the Great Recession here. And of course, the COVID recession. Now, it's, it's actually kind of hard to see. But the core CPI number, so everything except for food and energy, is the blue one. Do you see how nice and stable that blue line is for most of the 20th, 21st century? That's because the US has a nice stable rate of inflation, except for most recently, right? In the wake of our COVID recession, core inflation actually went up quite a bit, over 5%. Not so happy about that. However, it could be difficult to, to see a stable trend and then things having gotten a little unmoored, uh, 
it would be difficult to see that the blue line was nice and stable and now it went a little high and can we please get that back down again? If we had in there the data for food, so food is in red, you can already see food jumps a lot more, but of course the real villain here, energy in green, energy prices like you know, gas and natural gas and oil and electric, they can just go crazy. So if you've got that much noise in your data, it's easy to miss an underlying trend. And yeah, I mean, some of these, some of these peaks here, or look at this crazy deflare, minus 30% decrease in, in energy prices, just crazy. You don't want, you don't want that throwing off your analysis. So that's why core CPI can be a nice Supplemental measure to keep track of the rate of inflation. Let me emphasize one more time. I'm sure you're sort of sick of hearing it by now, but it's not the actual official rate of inflation. The actual official rate of inflation, you know, people need gas. Gas has to be part of that measure. It just might make it harder to look at. There are a couple of other problems with the consumer price index, but again, we, we actually have some ways to deal with this. So let's talk about it. Remember the bananas? Remember the bananas going to $10 in October in our math example? So if you look at the regular consumer price index and you have a detailed category like that, that gets really quite expensive, it ticks up what we measure as the rate of inflation. And you know, perhaps that's fair, right? Um, prices are in fact up. But are consumers actually going to keep buying those bananas? Is it fair to say, you know, the cost of living is up 200% just because bananas are $10? It probably doesn't actually make a ton of sense for the real world, right? If something super specific like that blows up, uh, people will switch away from that. We call that substitution bias. The regular consumer price index estimates the actual rate of inflation a little too high, it's, it's just a little, because people have the ability to switch away from big price increases sometimes. So just to be clear, the consumer price index does allow a little bit of substitution within a detailed category. Like one of the detailed categories there, the citrus, you've got lemons and limes in there. <laughs> if, if limes go way up and lemons don't, then the way the math works, it, it lets the lemons compensate a little bit for limes having gone way up. But the conventional CPI does not allow switching between categories, like between apples and oranges, for example, or the bananas. So if we have a big price increase in one of those, like the overall detailed category, then we have to wait all the way until we get our new expenditure um, weights there January of every year before consumers are allowed to switch, so to speak. I mean, they've already switched in real life, but our data hasn't caught up. That's the problem. Now, the good news is there is an attempt to address this. It's one of the newest CPI measures with us for the 21st century, the so-called CCPIU chain CPIU. And basically what it does is it samples more often what detailed categories people are actually buying. So the bananas go up to $10, people switch to apples, the chain CPIU actually lets the consumer switch to apples within the year in terms of how we're tracking the data. And that's great because it lets us deal with the substitution bias. The problem is it takes much longer for data to appear that actually tracks the specific products that people are buying. Like it's, it's, it's a huge statistical undertaking. We're, we're talking about things like the Bureau of Labor Statistics giving diaries to people where they like track what they buy when they go shopping and things like that. It, it's really hard. So basically the chain CPIU comes out when the regular CPIU comes out, but the data isn't complete and it gets revised a couple of times, and then basically it takes a year before we've got the finalized chain CPIU data in there. And now it's the better number, absolutely. 
But quite often, if we're asking a, a question about inflation, you know, hey, we now know more accurately what happened a year ago, just isn't what we're looking for. So for the headline numbers, you know, we'll take the thing that's available now, thank you very much, which is the traditional CPIU. So that's substitution bias. You can address it, just slows things down a little bit. But I should also mention that's right now, chain CPIU being a little bit slower. Um, over the years since the consumer price index started being tracked, and again, this started all the way in 1913, it's gotten faster and faster on how quickly the products in this thing update. I mean, it used to, like, it could take a decade or two for a product to go in there. Now for the regular one, we're already like, every year there's an update, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if later in our lives that chain CPIU number ends up really catching up with the current data as well. Okay, so that's the substitution bias. And then we've got a second type of problem that you can't so nicely show in a little table math example. So we'll just sort of talk about it. Even though um, conceptually the Bureau of Labor Statistics is tracking what people are spending on a fixed set of products, hey, here are six bananas. Let's just look at what it costs to buy six bananas month after month. The truth is many product categories actually change over time, right? So, so one aspect of it is the quality of existing products may change up or down, could go either way. And if price goes up, but quality is up, then, you know, part of the price is actually paying for better quality. Or if price is steady, but quality is down, we'd actually consider that inflation because you're not getting for your money what you used to. And then very closely related to that, to a quality change, you might also have entirely new products showing up in the spending behaviors of the consumers. So again, Bureau of Labor Statistics tries to adjust for this, and it does. It's just not perfect at it because it's such a hard problem. So how, how do quality changes get addressed? If there is a quality change, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics has product experts for each of those detailed categories to like understand what to look for here, the Bureau of Labor Statistics tries to remove the impact of the quality change from the price change. The underlying technique here is called hedonic analysis. Don't worry about what that means exactly. But basically what the Bureau of Labor Statistics says is, okay, our product experts for men's suits has looked at men's suits over the years and determined that the following aspects of a man's suit um, represent quite a bit of a price difference. What's it made of? Wool, polyester. Uh, how many buttons does it have? Is the waistband elastic? Are the pants hemmed already? Is it a store brand or is it a luxury brand? So the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks these features about the products. And then if a suit changes and, you know, oh, this year it's got an elastic waistband and the price went up a couple percentage points, well, we'll actually treat part of that as not an increase in price because it now is the elastic waistband or vice versa. Like if it suddenly went from wool to polyester, <laughs> same price, we actually say that that's a, that's a hefty price increase. Likewise, with new products, um, you can try to match them. That typically doesn't work. So more often what has to happen is we have to wait for the resurvey so that it enters that new January list. And that might happen like this coming January when a new product is out, but because of like the sampling within the various subcategories that could take also like two years before it's in there, which again, is actually really fast <laughs> compared to like back in the 20th century when things like that could take many years or even decades. It's gotten much better. There's one aspect the Bureau of Labor Statistics is fantastic at controlling for um, because it's much easier and quantifiable. Sometimes people worry about this, the concept of shrinkflation, where a business, instead of raising the price on a product, 
reduces the quantity in it. Oh, the bottle of orange juice now has 58 ounces instead of 62 ounces. Oh yeah, Bureau of Labor Statistics catches that immediately and always does quantity adjustments when it tracks those price changes. So that one is in there. Really, really good. Okay, so this was our introduction to the Consumer Price Index. Let's look at it one more time um, in terms of the effect of the substitution bias. So here in blue, we have what I'm going to call the traditional Consumer Price Index, the CPIU. It's not the one we started with in 1913. That's the CPIW, but it's the one we use now, right? Half since, oh, I don't even know, since the 1950s or something like that. It's been a while. And that's the one when you hear in the news, rate of inflation, 3.1%, blue line is what we're talking about right now. So let's just look at our recent experience here a little bit. Roughly speaking, we'll get into more details in a future module. We're looking for a rate of inflation of about 2% per year or so. Or so. We're, we're pretty happy at 2%. And then what we see, of course, Inflation isn't quite that stable, it, it, it sort of bounces around. But for the most part, 21st century, pretty decently on target. Major exceptions include Great Recession, big gas price increase, big collapse of the economy, whoops, deflation, bad news. And then of course, the recession that will ruin my charts forever, COVID lockdown right here, followed by big increases in the rate of inflation. We went very close to double digits if you are looking at um, year-over-year -year inflation, which is what we're looking at here. And if you, if you took monthly inflation and scaled it up, we actually went into the double digits there on a month-to-month -month basis a couple of times. Not good at all. As you can see, it's also starting to come back down. And then I said, hey, consumer price index has some problems, right? substitution bias. And even though the number is slower, we kind of have a fix for it. It's called the chain CPI, our newest consumer price index that's completely mainstream. It's, it's not actually the newest. They're always developing new price indices. For example, right now, I think they're working on a new one that tries to track new car prices better in cooperation with JD Powers. And I mean, in terms of like the mainstream ones that are already out there, right? This one started December 1999, so to do a year-over-year -year inflation rate, of course, can't do that till December 2000, because we have to go 12 months back, right, to do the year-over-year. -year. So here's the core CPI, sorry, the chain CPI starting at the end of 2000. And because it allows consumers to switch more realistically, I mean, the consumers are actually doing it. When I say it allows them, I mean in terms of the statistical model, right? The consumers are actually doing it and now we're catching that they are doing it, you can see if you take that problem out, the actual rate of inflation is maybe a little bit lower than what the headline CPI number would suggest. But how much? You know, like 0.3% per year, 0.5% per year, enough to care about, but not like, oh, we're just completely off in terms of how we perceive the current rate of inflation. So for any specific point in time, you know, I currently at this point in time, January, February 2024, I'd say grab the traditional CPI number because it's faster. Uh, but if you're, if you're looking at a really long run problem, for example, the whole social security situation, right? Like the payments go up every year with the rate of inflation, we're a little worried about how much that system is going to cost in the future with all the baby boomers retired. If we want to save a little money there, one thing we could do is we could say, hey, we got, we got a better measure of inflation now, chain CPIU, and it will make the increases a little lower because, you know, it's a different measure of inflation. And then, of course, people who receive Social Security will be very mad at you, so it's not quite that simple, but it would be an example of like a long-run process where you actually don't care about the number being slow, but you do care about it being more accurate. Now, this is the Consumer Price Index, the headline measure of inflation in the United States. 
There are a number of other price indices as well. We'll just sort of say hello to them for a minute and then we will say goodbye again. So we have the producer price index also done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Here we're tracking the prices at which domestic producers are selling products. Mm. How is that different to what we just talked about? Well, first of all, domestic producers might produce things that consumers never buy. Like if John Deere makes a combine harvester, that's going to show up in the producer price index that will never show up in a CPI survey, right? But really, much more importantly, the reason we love the producer price index is because it can capture product prices long before they reach the consumer because of the whole supply chain phenomenon, right? Like many products get sold many, many times along a supply chain and the producer price index often catches them right from the start. Like if a fishery catches a fish, sells the fish, to a food company, we're catching the price of that fish. So of course, if you see prices going up in the producer price index, that could be a warning sign that we're going to have CPI trouble down the line. Next, very similar, but for the foreign sector, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has the International Price Program, IPP, where it tracks the prices of imports, and also exports. So import prices, of course, to see is there going to be something affecting consumer prices there down the line, export prices in terms of how well our businesses can make money selling abroad. Um, it's just for the non-military stuff, military international stuff gets very special. So that's you're not going to gather data on that. And then here's one for the businesses, the employment cost index, also done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It measures the hourly cost of hiring labor in the United States. But as opposed to the um, survey, current population survey, CPS, we talked about in the previous module where we're talking about it from the employee side. Hey, how much money am I making? Employment cost index is talking about this from the employer side. So we're, for example, taking into account if there are changes in what it costs me to provide benefits to my employees, that's going to show up in there. So sort of other side of the transaction. So here with the PPI, IPP and ECI, we've got other numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then let me do a shout out back to one of our first modules, of course, the Bureau of Economic Analysis provides GDP data and GDP data includes an implicit price deflator, which is also a price index, but a price index of prices in GDP. And GDP, of course, measures final goods and services produced in our country. So at the, at the end of that particular supply chain, as opposed to producer price index, all producer prices, GDP, implicit price deflator, here we've got the prices at the end, domestic final goods and services. Um, shout out here to the implicit price deflator, or if anybody here is a data nerd, technically we use the price index now, not the implicit price deflator. Don't worry about it. They're basically the same number. What's really good about it is, is that it's good about allowing substitutions between products because we're pretty decent at measuring what actually gets produced. So it kind of gives us a benefit similar to the chained CPI, but faster. Downside of the implicit price deflate out of GDP is it's the prices of all final goods and services, not just the prices that face consumers. And often we care about the prices that just face consumers. So let me tell you about one more very advanced, very detailed, but it's my suspicion that this one will become more popular and important in the future. So GDP has got an implicit price deflator for all of GDP, but GDP also has subcategories, such as personal consumption expenditures, the big C. And that one has its own separate implicit price deflator. So it's a price index done by the Bureau of Economic Analysis that checks the prices of personal consumption expenditures. 
that's conceptually very similar to a consumer price index, but because it's a little better at dealing with substitution, many people say, I believe this too, that when the Federal Reserve makes monetary policy, we'll talk about who they are and how they do that down the line, um, that they actually like looking at that personal consumption expenditures IPD a little bit more than the CPI. We talk about the CPI because that's the official headline rate of inflation for the United States. But again, like, I don't know, maybe a couple decades from now, we end up switching over to that personal consumption expenditures number. All right, that's enough talking about the future. Let's wrap up this module. Hopefully, in this module, you learned how to describe how the consumer price index is measured. How to use a reference period to calculate an index number. How to calculate an inflation rate. How to identify ways in which the Bureau of Labor Statistics reduces bias in the CPI. And how to differentiate between the CPI, PPI, IPP, ECI, and GDPIPD. I will see you next time.